Thank you so much, Alina. And uh, especially thanks to the Grand Gallery for making this all possible. Uh, I'm from Holland. Um, I'm a notary, a civil law notary, so my life every day is about the law and making documents, etc., etc. So posters are my hobby. And it started a long time ago when I stumbled over a collection and I fell just in love with the material because they tell you about life from people who lived during the tumultuous 20th century. And that century, of course, had the industrial revolution, the mass production of consumer goods that had to be sold through means of advertisement. The cinema came into being, and the cars, etc., etc., but also the political developments and the great wars. Now, what we see here is a wonderful exhibition of posters from Soviet Russia from the 1920s, and it is in this context that these objects that belong to Jacob Verkov are being shown. Um, it is all the re also the reason that I came into the possession of these objects, because as a poster collection collector, I was impressed with the designers from the 1920s, the Bauhaus style from Germany, the De Stijl group, Mondrian and Van Duisburg from Holland, the Russian constructivists, etc. And if you collect the posters, then of course you want to know what they are all about and you want to see the films because that's what they advertise. So when I collected the posters in the 1990s, early 1990s, late 1980s, when they first came out of the former Soviet Union, I became interested in the, in the films and you cannot understand the importance of the posters and the graphic design without the knowledge of the history of the period. So it was the avant-garde artists from Germany who were influenced by Gustav Klutzes from the Soviet Union who first experimented with photomontage. Photomontage in prints and in Germany especially they wanted to upgrade their printing techniques and the um, typographical possibilities to print better advertisements that would grip the masses so that people would understand these messages much easier. Why was that promoted in Russia? It was very easy. The revolution in 1917 was also a revolution of people who were illiterate and they were called up to the um, revolutionary stand by means of posters. And they had to be gripping clearly understandable because people couldn't read them. It's also the time of the film without sound. So even the films from that period, which are obviously very much related to the photography, um, were easy to understand. Everyone who has seen these old films knows that you have a scene and then suddenly a title to explain the next scene or what's going on. But mostly you don't need a title. It's obvious what the film is about. And in the end, it all comes to a good stop, a stop uh, and, and the, the good guy gets the, the girl. I mean, that's, that's what those films were about. So you've heard from Eva that Vertov changed all this, but it was not just Vertov, it was also Pudokin and it was Eisenstein. And they influenced the people in the West, Western Europe, immensely. There was a hunger for new developments and it was Lisitsky who came to Berlin in 1922 and um, became friends with typographers, designers from the Bauhaus uh, era. He lectured at the Bauhaus and he met there Jan Chikold, a typographer who later was based in Munich. They became very good friends and Jan Tickold was the man who started the collection of this material to write the book, which became very influential and it was called in 1926, not 1928, The New Typography. And it was the Bible for all art students who were interested in courses of 
typography in Germany. Now, of course, and now we come to the political part, in Germany, in the 1920s, you had the Weimar Republic. There had been a Hitler putsch in uh, 1923 in, in Munich that had misfired and he was put in jail. There were the uh, Spartacists with Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in Berlin and they were murdered in 1922. And in that period, everything communist was very dangerous. Um, of course, there was a communist party. They tried to convince the Germans to uh, do what their brothers in the East had done and to go the communist way and to get away with capitalism. But of course, there were the counterparts from the Nazi party who came to power later on but gained influence in the 20s and the socialists who were sort of in between. Now, in that period, in Holland, uh, there was a movement that was very much interested in this new form of design, the new form of cinema. And in 1929, this uh, so-called Film Liga invited two famous uh, film directors to Holland. And it were Eisenstein and Podovkin. They came to Holland, they lectured there, they showed their films. And it was because in 1926, one of the most important films came to the West, and that was the Panzer, the, the uh, uh, battleship Potemkin poster, uh, the, the film. The poster is hanging there, and that's a poster by the famous Stenberg brothers, but that's a later edition poster. The first poster was produced by Rochenko in 1926. Now, in Holland, there was a, a poster done, and here we see the poster for the Potemkin film produced in Holland by a Dutch designer, a lady, in 1926. Now, this is an important poster because it was not banished and the film was allowed to be screened. In Germany, however, the Potemkin film was forbidden, it was censored, and also in Holland there were people who said, well, we should not show such a revolutionary film because it might actually cause a revolution. Uh, especially in Holland, everyone still knew the story of the Belgians. They had succeed, seceded from Ho uh, Holland in 1830 because the revolution broke out after uh, an opera, La Muette de Portici in Brussels. And after the opera, the masses went to the streets and the revolution started. So it was not without reason that they were afraid that even a film could start a revolution. And this was, of course, about, although a revolution 1905 that had not succeeded, but 1917, the October Revolution, also a big film by Eisenstein, and everyone was afraid that, you know, it would happen again. So this poster, this film, 1926 in Holland, caused the Dutch to start a censorship committee. So afterwards, if you want to show a film in Holland, you needed to go through the censorship committee and if it was too revolutionary, no way of showing your film. Now, in 1929 also, Vertov came to the West, and that's an important lecture tour, and it is why you see all these uh, papers here. Um, when he came, he was invited by the German counterpart to the Dutch Film Liga, also avant-garde artists like Kurt Schwitters, like Jan Tickold, like George Trump, and all kinds of people that would later uh, also be banished by the Nazis and uh, would leave the country to uh, save their lives in 1933. Um, he started in Berlin, gave a lecture there, then he went on to uh, Hanover, uh, gave a lecture there, and it's interesting to know that in June 1929, that they advertise him as being Giga Vethoff, which is the German way of pronouncing Vethoff, Vethoff. Um, why did they do that? Because his original name was David Kaufmann, which is a perfectly German name, of course. And his brother was shooting the films under his name Kaufmann. 
So he's labeled as Kaufman in the, in the posters. Uh, it is for political reasons. They knew, 1929, if they would say, Chika Vertov, that the Nazis would come and disrupt the lectures. So he was advertised with the German name. Um, he gave the lecture and, of course, he showed films. You can only show films if you bring them with you. And it caused an uproar because these were revolutionary films and they were screened for very small audiences and only for one evening at a time. And most interestingly, he lectured at the famous film and photo exhibition, the FIFO in Stuttgart, 1929. Now, I've talked to people who really researched this exhibition, which was the first time in continental Europe that experimental photography and photomontage was being shown to the public. And when I said that Vertov had lectured there, they said, you are nuts. That's absolutely not true. No way, because we have researched everything. There is not a newspaper clipping about his lecture. He's not in the program, etc., etc. So, obviously, and it's, if you read German, you can see that it must have been a spur of the moment idea. He was in Hanover. He went to Stuttgart and he gave the lecture and it was just sent out a few days before the lecture was given. Um, afterwards he went to Munich and in Munich his friend Jan Chikol designed this poster, large poster like the Potemkin uh, poster that's hanging there, or the horizontal one. And um, interestingly this is why I got all this material about Vertov. Because I was doing a book on Jan Chikol's posters and I knew that a dealer in this kind of material in Amsterdam had this poster. So I asked him, can I buy the poster? He said, yes, but it's part of an archive. And we are talking about 15 years ago. So I said, what kind of archive? And he showed me all this material. And I said, it's nice material, but where's the poster? He said, well, I have it somewhere, I can't find it. But if you buy the archive, I'll find it and it's part of the archive. Then I looked at this material and said, well, this is quite extraordinary to find this kind of material 15 years ago in a, in a shop in Amsterdam. And then he showed me something special because he opened his fridge. And in the fridge was this tin. And when he opened the tin, um, out of came a film, celluloid, 35 millimeters, and it turned out to be a trailer for the film The Eleventh. Uh, Vertov had been asked to make a film to celebrate the 10 years of the Russian Revolution in 1927, and because of political troubles between Russia and the Ukraine, what's new? Um, and of course he was from the Ukraine originally. He changed his uh, membership of Sovkino to the Vufku, which was the counterpart from Ukraine. It caused the delay in making the film, so the film is not called the Tens Year, which was originally what it was supposed to be, but it was called the Eleventh Year. Why not? Um, the film he took with him on a lecture tour later on. The General is a famous movie and I choose this poster because most people even today have seen this film. Slapdick, Buster Keaton at his best. Usually American posters from that era and even today just show the image that sort of shows the biggest actor or actress or the most important moment in the film, they add the text and it's very illustrative and very kitschy. Now, in 1927, there was one artist working in America, uh, Hap Hadley, who really made a designed poster for a special purpose. So this is the original American poster for the Buster Keaton classic, The General. 
the poster was adapted in Holland by that same artist who did the poster for the Potemkin. This is two years later, 1928, in Holland. And of course, the, the title of the cinema should have been printed there, but this is not a poster that was used. Now, these posters are extremely rare. The, this poster, there are three copies known in the world to have survived. This poster, just two copies. Then the general goes to Soviet Russia and the Stenberg brothers design a completely different poster, very intellectual design because if you know the film, you know that it's about the um, civil war in America and the man who is on the train and he crosses the front lines between the North and the Southern armies. So, here you see the front line, and when he is in the south, he is an enemy. And if he is if in the north, then he's an ally. But it's all mixed up because it's a slapstick film, and it's a very clever design to show the contents of the film, and of course Buster Keaton himself, who was called the man who never loves. And this is Jan Tickholz. 1927 in Munich. Completely new approach, using the photo and the typeset, and he captures the moment that Buster Keaton is listening, why is this not working? <laughs> and then we have the Stenbergs again, but for the film The Eleventh Year by Vertov. And you see that in 1928-29, the use of the photomontage in the posters had traveled first from Klutzes, who used it in little booklets and, and political ephemera, to Germany. Then it was sort of perfected by Jan Tickelt, and the Jan Tickelt posters traveled to Moscow and influenced the Russian avant-garde artists. Before this period, and usually the photos were just repainted in the posters. And they didn't use actually photomontage technique to reprint the photos. And in the eyes, of course, you see the photomontage. So this comrade sees the achievements of 11 years of the Soviet Revolution. This poster is for the film The Man with the Movie Camera. It's an Ukrainian poster by an Ukrainian artist. You can see here the stamp of the Dutch censors, which means the poster was used in Holland. This poster, Vertov took with him in 1931 when he made an other tour of Western Europe. He gave lectures again. He showed his new first sound movie, Enthusiasmus. It was also shown here in London, and in his uh, memoirs, Vertov recalls that here in London, and it must have been around November the 15th, 1931, he had an uh, encounter with Charlie Chaplin, which made a lasting impression on this Russian person and director. There is the libretto of this film, and after London, he went back across the North Sea to Holland, where he gave lectures and showed his films. The interesting thing is that he had started again in Hanover in 1931. And there, of course, the Nazis had gained even more power. They would grab complete power in 1933. Um, his films were completely forbidden. So when, in 1931, he came from London to Holland, he had to cross hostile Germany to get back to Russia. And when he decided to go back, he didn't dare take his films with him. Lucky for us. Because that's the reason these films still exist and are now in the Dutch Film Museum in Amsterdam. 
What he took with him, however, was the trailer to the film The Eleventh because it was animated so it had no political content. And he took with him the pen and the watch that were given to him on his lecture tour by way of saying thank you for giving the lecture. So these are very personal items. He went back through Germany to Stalinist Russia and where the avant-garde movie makers and artists who did these posters in the early 1920s, let's say up to 1930, had sort of a liberal spring, cultural spring from the Lenin area, era. He came back into the winter of the Stalinist era. He died in 1954, almost forgotten. And um, in the 1960s, the Austrian Film Museum decided to go to Russia and to try to find material on this very important uh, film director. They found his family and the family sold them the complete archive that was left, except for those very personal items that he had cherished the most. That are the items that are here. And they came only to the West in the 1990s and landed in the hands of the dealer in Amsterdam where I found the archive. So I bought it, I gave the film on loan because it was, you know, very, uh, uh, if you do the 35 millimeter uh, uh, celluloid, it's flammable. I mean, if you heat it, it just dis uh, deteriorates. Uh, I gave it to the film museum in Amsterdam. They preserved it. And I will show you the film in a short moment. But for those who don't read Russian or Ukrainian, whatever it is, uh, I had it translated because it has all these <laughs> titles in between. So. It shows a new title, a new film. It's in film language, so it's, you know, something special. It's unusual. It's in 1927, which later turned out to be 1928. And it's done in the, with the concept of the movie camera. Director is Jacob Vertov. It is a visual symphony, and it's called The Eleven. Now, there is a little gap in the film because when I purchased it, it was broken because it's all, it was, it's animated. So screen by screen, it was made and, and put together and at some point it was broken. But it's, it should go in one fluency. 